Hi, everybody, and welcome to the presentation, Local Partnership for the Greater Good, Library Publishing at the University of Minnesota. My name is Shane Ackard. I'm the Interim Director of Content Services at the University of Minnesota Libraries, and I'm joined by my colleague, Emma Moles, the Publishing Services Library Librarian uh, in uh, the University Libraries. And we are going to talk to you a little bit about the partnership and collaboration and the tools uh, that built the Open Access Journal uh, Open Rivers and how that effort uh, really uh, launched and helped uh, uh, launch the publishing services uh, department at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Let's see. Before we get started, though, I wanted to get some acknowledgments out. Uh, it wasn't just Emma and I that, uh, that worked on this project. Um, it was a large team, including uh, John Barneson, Lorene Boutang, and Kate McCready uh, for the publishing uh, services team. Uh, and also Pat Nunnally, Joanne Richardson, and Lori Morberg of uh, the River Life uh, project uh, that we'll describe in just a little bit. We also wanted to acknowledge that the University of Minnesota is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. In fact, the entire state is really located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. And that's important um, because we wanted to uh, acknowledge this presentation really is ultimately about the Mississippi River, uh, which is uh, an important waterway for both uh, the Ojibwe and the Dakota. Uh, the name Mississippi, in fact, comes from the Ojibwe words for great river. The, uh, the river actually begins in Minnesota and it flows through the campus of the University of Minnesota, as you can see by these, these graphics. In fact, the uh, University of Minnesota has a research lab that sits on top of the Mississippi River. Um, it's a big part of campus life, this river, uh, both for the research that we do on the river and because it's really hard to miss. Uh, staff can sometimes walk across the river three to four times a day on the way to meetings or just on a walk. In fact, I think my own record is six times that I crossed the river in one day. Uh, maybe Emma has a higher record. <laughs> um, and uh, the river is also a big part of the surrounding community. Um, it's a connection for the university to the community. Um, and uh, um, yeah, like I said, it's just a big part of that. The, um, the Institute for Advanced Study uh, is a university-wide uh, interdisciplinary research center that is a part of uh, the University of Minnesota. And one of their big goals is to connect the university with the surrounding community um, and then bring those, uh, the community, the, the people in the community and uh, the ideas, uh, the research of the university uh, to the community. The um, Institute for Advanced Studies has a project inside of it called River Life. And River Life is um, a project that focuses heavily on the Mississippi River. And um, they, they do research on the interplay between communities and the water that uh, those communities rely on, again, especially the Mississippi. Um, they seek to create that new knowledge about rivers and water um, and then share that uh, knowledge with uh, the community um, uh, at large. So in 2015, uh, the River Life Project approached the university libraries uh, with the idea to publish an open access online publication which eventually became uh, the publication, the Open Access Journal, R Open Rivers. Um, they sought to, uh, again, disseminate the scholarship about rivers and water <clears throat> and uh, the communities that they impact. Um, and if you uh, want to see uh, the, the journal, the Open Access Journal, uh, the URL is right uh, there. Um, Emma is now gonna talk a little bit about how we built uh, the journal and uh, the process that we went through. Yeah, great. Thanks, Shane. Uh, so when a group like uh, Institute for Advanced Study and River Life come to the University of Minnesota libraries with questions about publishing, um, there's now a very established process for how we take on publications. We have a call for proposals. We have a proposal that everyone fills out. We walk through the different steps. All of the proposals are reviewed. We sort of uh, do a little bit of matchmaking to see if our publishing program is really the best fit for it, or oftentimes there's actually another library service um, that our colleagues at the University of Minnesota run that may be a better fit. So think something like a institutional repository or digital collections like that. Um, but when Open Rivers started or when the, what 
uh, the group that ended up being the editorial board for Open Rivers came to the libraries in 2015. Publishing services was really brand new. So a lot of our infrastructure wasn't in place the way that it is now. Um, but a lot of the early conversations with the people that ended up becoming editors of Open Rivers revolved around, we're thinking a lot about what would make this publication successful? What are the goals of this publication? I think for anyone who has worked uh, really on any project with researchers, but especially library publishing programs, uh, talking about the publication goals are incredibly important because they really get you started. So for us, when uh, Open Rivers approached us, um, having that conversation about publication goals happened really early on. And part of this was because they needed really clear language to get their project off the ground, and we wanted to help them do that. Um, so some of those early publication goals uh, described by Open Rivers was that the goal of the publication would be to engage with decision makers concerning news, research, stories about the river, uh, especially surrounding the Mississippi River, uh, as Shane said, and thinking about how scholars, faculty, students, and public community members fit into that. So the focus really was this local Mississippi River, but also thinking about what are the broader implications beyond our state and beyond our boundaries. Um, so that itself is a really big goal, right? I think it kind of goes beyond thinking of what other publications might have um, because it's really embedded into that sense of community and building a community around it. The other goal that was early identified was to provide a gathering space for interdisciplinary, scholarly works, and community-based ways of knowing. Uh, so these two elements really describe a lot of what was at the heart of what Open Rivers wanted to do. They wanted to create a journal, but they also wanted it to be not another academic journal. So you'll notice that one of the goals that is not in here is robust peer review. Um, there's, there's nothing that uh, is sort of uh, maybe a little bit more specific of what we think about when we think about academic journals. So we knew Open Rivers was going to be something that wasn't exactly like uh, traditional journals out there. Next slide. So in thinking about goals, I think the next question, and uh, those of us in higher ed are, are well aware of this question, which is, well, how, how are we going to measure that? How, how will we know if those goals are met? What kind of benchmarking are we going to do? For Open Rivers, it was really a question of asking, how will we know when we've arrived? How, how are we going to know that these goals are met? What, what kind of map are we going to be using to try to navigate through this really complicated world of building a community, um, of creating a space, even though the journal is digital? How are we going to know if any of those are are, if we're meeting any of those goals. Um, Pat, who was, of course, one of the partners uh, with Open Rivers, put it best, and I, I can remember pretty clearly that early meeting when we talked about uh, measures of success or how, how we know when we've arrived, as Pat said, what would, what would make us successful is if we start getting submissions from people who we've never heard of. Um, I thought that was especially a good point on Pat, Pat's part because anyone who's built a journal knows that really those first few issues, you have to recruit a lot of content. It's about gathering voices that you want represented in your journal and having kind of a nice product come out. So Pat said, you know, the, the, the highest goal that we want to shoot with, shoot for, especially right at the beginning is getting content from people who we don't know. They've found our journal and now they're submitting to us. So those publication goals really link directly into measures of success. Um, you know, I'll just say real briefly, and this is really part of what we are as a library publisher is we never want our publications to meet our specific measures of success, right? So we are not looking for bottom line where we do not charge subscription fees. We don't have sort of a business model that bases our success on uh, revenue. So that's out of the picture. Um, we also don't want to be enforcing maybe um, traditional and, and fairly antiquated measures of success with journals of th thinking of things um, like citation rates. Uh, we really want our publications to define their own success. So taking those publishing those publication goals and matching them with measures of success um, is something that we do now with all of our publications and Open Rivers was a really great example into that. Next slide. 
So as I've described, um, the publications goals and the measures of success are sort of two elements. But when we think about building the publication, there's, of course, a lot more that goes into it. So those two pieces, the goals and the measures of success, are really foundational conversations that happen when we first start off with a publication. Um, we have a lot more questions that, that sort of expand on that to get a finished product, uh, but those are two really key elements. So there's a lot of things that kind of go into how to build a publication, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the other elements of that, which include thinking about users and objectives and experience ideation. Next slide. So in thinking about the users, this is really, um, I would say, uh, a, a way of thinking that we borrowed a lot from um, the members of our team who have experience in web development, in digital projects, um, is to think about who is actually going to be using the site. So not only is the journal producing content, it's also a digital experience that people are having when they come to the site. So one of our early conversations prior to really getting our hand, hands on to building the infrastructure is to talk through with the editors about the different types of users and their objectives. So early in the publication goals, um, the, the folks at Open Rivers were really great about identifying this wide variety of people. So breaking that down to be a little bit more specific into thinking about users, um, we had the editorial team walk through sort of steps of identifying each user group and ranking those into who is likely your, your most common user down to maybe your secondary or tertiary users. So the user one, uh, scholars and administrators from off campus that are uh, deciding the Mississippi River's future. So this is really a gigantic one. Uh, these, are, these are people who are decision makers who are thinking about the future of the Mississippi. User two is University of Minnesota faculty. Um, this is, I think, another highlight of how local this journal started. You'll notice that that does not say all tenure track faculty, it says U of M faculty, uh, encouraging them to share their research off campus. So that was the objective for that user group. And user three are graduate students. Um, and the Open Rivers folks identified the publication as being an ideal outlet for graduate students to contribute content. And that kind of speaks to sort of lowering some of the, bar the barriers into publication that Open Rivers really took on. Yes, thanks, Emma. Um, next thing we'd like to talk to uh, uh, new journals about is uh, the idea of uh, experience ideation. Um, and really, it's represented in that question. When users interact with a publication, what would you like them to do? It helps us prioritize how to set up the site and find out what is most important to the journal editors. Um, in this case, uh, you know, some obvious things come out. Um, they wanted people to be able to read the features, the columns, the articles, uh, and the pulse, which we'll describe in just a little bit, which is a, a blog-like feature uh, that they wanted to incorporate into the journal as well. Um, a big one was also learning, uh, having people learn how to submit. Uh, they wanted people to be able to see quickly how they can submit and what are the criteria for submission. Um, and as Emma was saying, one of the uh, things that Pat had told us is the really uh, a measure for success was, you know, people uh, that they don't know uh, submitting uh, articles uh, for publication. So getting that information out there was important. Uh, they also wanted um, uh, information about each author to be uh, readily available and findable. Um, and I think that goes to, uh, you know, encouraging authors to um, submit so, uh, and, and that we would build the site so that the authors would receive uh, credit and people would be able to find out quickly who, who wrote these pieces. And then they wanted people to be able to give feedback um, in, in some way uh, on the features and columns that were in the journal. Um, as we started to uh, put all this together, you know, uh, a decision started to come forward that we would use WordPress to put together this journal um, through this entire discovery process that became more and more clear. Um, you know, when you talk more about uh, the experience that people, that they wanted people to have, uh, uh, they wanted, as the second bullet said, a blog-like feature um, that they could update outside of regular issues um, in order to keep readers coming back between the issues. Um, so that was a, a new a wrinkle on, on a journal that we uh, wanted to build in. They also wanted to be like a journal though. They wanted uh, to be able to create uh, sequenced issues, but not necessarily volumes. 
Um, so uh, if you look at the journal, um, it goes in order. I think they're up to uh, issue 18 now. Um, and they wanted a very robust taxonomy, uh, including a lot of content types uh, and subject uh, or uh, keyword uh, tagging. Um, and then they wanted people to be able to use that taxonomy to find uh, different articles and features and content types and subject matter. Um, we'll get into that just a little bit too. They also have the idea of including a world map where a reader can um, can select articles based on the area of the world that they might be interested in, or to even just see the world map and see where articles have been published about. It was an interesting feature that we were excited to build in. Uh, and then obviously there was uh, a desire for a lot of multimedia, including the ability to embed videos and that kind of thing, and uh, social media. So WordPress was the decision. Um, and we started then to think about, okay, uh, what kind of a theme and plugins do we need to embed in here to get the functionality that is desired? Uh, we decided to use the issue M uh, plugin, um, which uh, in WordPress allows for the creation of articles and then you can assign those articles to specific issues. So that was a nice feature. Um, and then also um, they, we decided to use the theme called Simple Mag and that was just a really simple uh, easy to customize a theme um, uh, that's built around the idea of a magazine. Um, and uh, we use that to create the, the uh, interface that you see on the right there. Um, other plugins that we decided to use, uh, we decided to use something called the Content Views plugin. And that was in order to set up this grid-like feature or uh, you know, set up grids for the different uh, um, uh, articles and, and that pulse that I was talking about, the uh, blog-like feature. These are uh, uh, rep these the articles represented on this page are uh, Pulse articles. We also uh, wanted people to be able to again use all of the taxonomy that was developed, um, and you can see on the right uh, the different ways that they decided to describe um, the articles, the columns, the features, and those Pulse um, blog entries um, by sector, by place, by discipline. And then um, on you know, the Explore the Journal page, which is what we're on now, you can click on some of these different uh, drop-down menus to get access to um, the different um, um, content types and categories. Um, here's another example here. So a really unique and, and functional way that readers can find articles that might interest them. Uh, as I was saying, they wanted a, a world map that would show where articles are being written from and written about. Um, we decided to use a plugin called WP Google Maps, which is an extremely powerful um, plugin, which I think did a really nice job of uh, giving the editors what they wanted. Uh, as you can see below, you can hover over any of these dots to find out a little more information, and then you click on the more information um, link in order to get to uh, the article uh, itself. Um, there, as you can see, a uh, heavy focus on the Mississippi River, which is no surprise. Um, so I think uh, it's, it's a really quick way that a reader can see um, what's being written about. Um, WordPress, there's some pros and cons around the decision to use WordPress. Uh, obviously, it's a very flexible tool, um, which is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you can make it do really what you really want it to be able to do, um, anything is uh is possible but you really have to know what you're doing and the curse of that is um people start to request more and more and more and you have to maybe sometimes hold editors back um, from creating maybe a too complex of a site um it can easily include multimedia such as images and videos and it has a really nice way of storing that uh, that information uh, in the back end um, it's uh, extensible, very extensible, with a myriad of plugins that can be attached to um, a particular site, as I was demonstrating in previous slides. Uh, very easy to use for editors. Um, I think, what do they say, a WordPress drives about 35% of the web in general, so there's a lot of, a lot of prior knowledge about WordPress that, uh, that some people have. Um, the editor uh, uh, one of the editors of Open Rivers was very familiar with how to use WordPress, so that was um, a big plus. Uh, one of the big cons, though, is that it, it requires regular maintenance um, and updates, and that's very important for security reasons. Because it's so popular, uh, WordPress is a target for 
hackers. Um, and so it needs to be maintained very regularly. Um, also, uh, it's updated regularly, so plugins can break, um, functionality can break. So we have to keep on top of that. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning in the acknowledgments, we have a, um, a dedicated uh, a developer that uh, helps maintain this journal, which is um, a very nice thing to have. So it has now been um, about six years since we started working on Open Rivers. And, you, you know, as Shane just nicely covered, Shane and I do not work hands on with the actual content or content decisions of Open Rivers. That's what the editorial board does. Um, but we certainly work on the maintenance and we partner with them to help guide uh, additional goals um, and measures of success. But I did want to reflect a little bit about what these six years have meant for our library service for publishing service was within the U of M libraries. Um, and some of that really mirrors some of the changes that Open Rivers has, have, have gone under. So uh, we have both Open Rivers and publishing, uh, and publishing Services seen a lot of growth um, within ourselves. So Publishing Services, when we started, we had um, uh, Open Rivers was one of our earlier journals. We had a, a few others that were just getting off the ground, a handful of textbooks, um, and that's about it. Uh, six years later, we have um, over 20 journals, uh, almost 40 textbooks, uh, conference proceedings, and uh, digital monographs. So we have grown a lot. Um, Open Rivers, likewise, has continued, as Shane said, to publish issues. Um, they have uh, even expanded the focus of the journal. So it started off specifically focused on the Mississippi. Uh, after a couple of years, the editors thought, you know, we're really seeing a lot of interest in the journal that has to do with water, but ne not necessarily the Mississippi River. Um, we're going to expand it. So they went under a, a, a slight title change. Their subtitle actually changed to be uh, thinking specifically about the Mississippi to thinking about water, place, and community in general. I think for any of us who know anything about the Mississippi, that makes sense uh, regardless, because the Mississippi, of course, is connected to so many other waterways. Um, so we've seen a lot of growth. Uh, what we've also learned in publishing services is really how to leverage uh, lessons that we learn across each publication to the new publications that we develop. So there are certainly, as with any project, things that we did in Open Rivers in those early years that we would not do again or we would do in a different way. Um, it's, it's really been great to have Open Rivers as one of our foundational pieces because we learned a lot from that experience, including how many uh, technical barriers and things we would just have to figure out. We also established additional connections across campus. I can't tell you how many uh, consultations or projects have been pushed our way from the folks at IAS um, or for the folks who work specifically on open rivers it's it's been wonderful and uh the final thing is that we've also had a lot of technology expansion we've changed platforms before um we we've come off of some things we've gone into new platforms WordPress has been something that we've stuck with the whole time. Um, and one of the challenging things about Open Rivers is that everyone sees Open Rivers uh, on our campus and they say, build me that thing. I want Open Rivers. It looks great. I want to run something like Open Rivers. So next slide. Um, something that we have done is actually build more uh, WordPress-based publications. Um, we have a journal from the Association of Historians of American Art that runs on WordPress. This was another one that it was highly visual. It made sense to go on WordPress. Um, it was a, a long build. It took a lot of work and Shane covered um, sort of all of those pros and cons of WordPress, but we couldn't be happier with, with how things are working out. Um, Smart Politics and Constitutional Commentary are two other publications that we have on WordPress. Um, we actually now are the publisher of all of the University of Minnesota law journals. Uh, this is a this was a pretty big step for us. Um, and for law, the, the law school functions very independently. They were self-publishing each of their uh, journals. They ran a, on a mix of WordPress and other things. We now um, publish all of their journals on WordPress. So we're, we couldn't be more thankful that Open Rivers was our uh, sort of learning environment to how to get a publication up onto WordPress. Next slide. Uh, finally, a few words and a sort of a reflection on partnership. Um, 
I think for both Shane and I, when, when we talk about partnerships, Open Rivers is definitely one of the first things that we talk about. It was, it's very much a partnership. It started at the very beginning as a partnership and it was very successful. There's lots of things about Open Rivers that I think are unique to that publication that made it successful. Um, one was that both of us uh, in publishing and in Open Rivers were very focused in, in this highlighting of local research and local experiences. Um, you know, it's it's no secret that one of the reasons why we started library publishing at the University of Minnesota was to serve campus um, and help identify publications that are on campus or that could be on campus that really highlight the University of Minnesota. Open Rivers, of course, started with that same approach was to, to have a very local uh, focus. One of the things that has really been uh, has made just a huge difference in the success of the publication is that uh, Open Rivers also were, they were able to bring people to the table to do some of the work. Um, so as I said earlier, Open Rivers is a publication people say, and they, they say, build me this publication. And that's really hard for us because there are people who work on Open Rivers um, who are paid to work on Open Rivers. That's that's how they're structured. It's part of their job responsibility at the University of Minnesota to work on the publication. And it makes a huge difference to have somebody who's looking out for the platform at all times, who we can work directly with when technical things come up, when there's maintenance that's needed. Um, so it, it just makes a huge difference that they were able to really contribute labor and time to the publication. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, that that goes both ways. We in publishing um, are always looking for uh, ways that we can serve the publication better or offer new services. Um, at different times, Open Rivers has kind of thought, you know, I think we may end up getting some publications that really need a, a highly uh, sort of technical peer review. So that they, they need tools built around peer review. We have tools to uh, help accomplish anonymous peer review. So we, we offer those tools forward. We've been able to get DOIs for all of the articles within Open Rivers. That was something that when we started, we didn't, we did not have the capacity nor the technology to issue DOIs for every article. We now do. Um, and, uh, and we're there for any changes that they need to make. So I think that's a big thing is that we're, we're we acknowledge that um, we're both growing and can continue to bring things to the table. Uh, the final thing I'll say about Open Rivers is that it has really been a fantastic journey. Um, we don't meet with the uh, with the folks from the publication too often. I think we meet on an annual basis um, and many emails in between, but it's really one of the meetings that I, I'm sure I speak for both Shane and myself when I say we really look forward to it. Um, and it's it's that piece of the partnership that has has really made this successful. Um, finally, uh, this is our contact information um, at the University of Minnesota Libraries Publishing. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the things that we've talked about here or uh, uh, partnerships on your own campus that you're looking to make within library publishing, Shane and I are, are happy to chat with you about that. And another final plug for reading Open Rivers. Um, I always say this to Open Rivers um, that you know, of all of the publications we publish at the University of Minnesota Libraries, uh, Open Rivers is the one that I, every issue, I read every article that's in it. Um, part of it is it's interesting local history. It's incredibly approachable. You don't have to be a subject expert in order to in order to read each article. Um, it's really a fantastic thing. Um, and they focus a lot on incorporating voices who otherwise are not incorporated into academic journals. So uh, check it out. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and thank you. <laughs>